Well, thank you, Jim, for that unpredictable and warm introduction. You always hold your breath when he's talking about you. Uh, thank you all for being here tonight to listen to a local friend. I'm honored uh, that you're all here, uh, really honored. Uh, this isn't something I expected to, uh, to do and uh, had my arm twisted and thought, well, good opportunity. I'll tell you what I think about health care. Uh, I'll do my best to make your time worthwhile. I'll present a few ideas that you may not have considered before about something that affects us all, health care. And I think that these are subjects that we all need to think about because change is coming to our system, and we need to be ready to guide it in the best channel when that time arrives. Seven years ago, uh, I was the president of an operating division of Abbott. Thought I had a tough job. I didn't know how easy I had it at the time. I was locked in the, uh, the sheltered environment of an operating company. I enjoyed running the division, creating and building products, marketing them to laboratories around the world. Actually, I thought it was one of the best jobs there was. And then I got a new job, this one. And my work life changed. When I first became CEO, I thought that this was going to be like running that division, just on a much larger scale. And I couldn't have been more wrong, because I found myself involved in more than just running a business. In fact, I don't do much running of a business anymore. Uh, I suddenly found myself at the nexus of multiple difficult, ongoing, and sometimes harsh debates on some of the most critical health care challenges that we face as a nation and as a global society. You can't be the chief executive of a large pharmaceutical or medical products company today and not be in the middle of all of these debates. So tonight, I'm going to take a look at the healthcare situation in the United States and offer a point of view regarding some of the key questions we face as a nation. I've tried to crystallize those into a half dozen or so overarching themes, namely, is there a crisis in healthcare? What's right with our healthcare system? Has our investment been worth it? Will it continue to be? Do we know what we want from our health care system? What's caused the cost of health care to rise so much? And how do we best deal with what is undoubtedly a pretty difficult cost crisis? And what should we expect going forward? And as we briefly consider these big questions in an admittedly limited amount of time, I will not ignore the obvious, those things that no one wants to say or admit about health care. Let's recognize the reality and the seriousness of these issues for all of us as individuals, as leaders of our community, and as citizens of our nation. These questions, which underlie all health care policy, are quite literally long-term matters of life and death. They ultimately influence how we live and perhaps when and how we will die. The other big fundamental fact to recognize at the outset is that these are our questions to answer and our issues to solve. We can debate ad infinitum what pocket the money should come from. Insurance companies, employers, doctors, hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, pharmacies, the government, patients. But it all comes down to the same thing. Whichever of these societal pockets the dollars come from, we pay. We pay in taxes or premiums or fees. Or we pay in lack of access, lack of quality, lack of progress. So this is our question to answer and ours to solve. So to the questions, is there a crisis in health care? There is. Pick up the Washington Post and you might conclude Social Security reform is the biggest domestic issue demanding attention today. But if you ask the business community, you'll get a different answer. To paraphrase a former presidential campaign slogan, it's health care, stupid. And it's specifically the ever-rising cost of care. Our steady investment in innovation over the past 40 years has made dramatic improvements in our health and the way that we live. For example, pharmaceutical advancements alone between 1960 and 2000 have dramatically improved health and survival. Just a few examples. In 1963, the year in which measles, the measles vaccine was first launched, there were three to four million U.S. cases of the disease. By 2003, there were only 54 confirmed U.S. measles cases. In 1968, 
there were 1.3 million deaths from coronary artery disease. The introduction of new treatments in the 80s and 90s, such as ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and thrombolytics and stents, led to a 61% decrease in deaths by the year 2000. In 1995, people with HIV had a 73% death rate. Just five years later in 2000, thanks to the introduction of new medicines, people with HIV had a 64% survival rate. In 1997, that recently, only 50% of people with chronic myelogenous leukemia lived one and a half years past diagnosis. Because of the introduction of kinase inhibitors, only five years later, the survival rate has risen to 89%. Those are miraculous results, and there are many more like them. I use these illustrations to show just a sample of the many medical innovations that continue to make dramatic differences in the length and the quality of the lives that we lead. Today, healthcare innovators, pharmaceutical and medical device companies, are spending $50 billion a year in research and development of pharmaceuticals and another $10 billion a year on medical devices. Over the past 50 years, we've seen an increase in our population's life expectancy from 68 years to 77 years. And this is directly attributable to the advancement of medical science since about World War II. From 1900 to that time, increases were due primarily to decreased infant mortality thanks to improved sanitation and vaccinations. Gains since then have been driven by improved healthcare techniques and technologies. All right, uh, keeping on the theme of broad topics, uh, given the spread of AIDS in the third world continues and throughout the continent of Africa and the belief that the world is inextricably linked with regard to healthcare and issues of health, is there a role for the pharmaceutical industry in providing guidance, leadership, and resources to aid countries experiencing the explosion of HIV AIDS infection? Well, this is an easy answer because I've, I've had to answer this one a lot. We're one of six companies that make uh, AIDS drugs uh, in the world, and we happen to provide the leading or most widely used AIDS drug in the world. Um, there's not only a role for us, there's an obligation for us as pharmaceutical companies to do that because of our unique capabilities. Um, we're the only entities in the world that make AIDS drugs, and uh, we're, we're as close to the disease as anyone can be. There are government agencies, non-governmental organizations, a lot of different uh, uh, faith-based groups and so forth that, that are all providing resources and care in some fashion, but only pharmaceutical companies are in the unique position uh, to provide uh, uh, medicines in particular uh, in the countries where the AIDS epidemic is so uh, extensive. And so consequently, given that unique role that we have, uh, we have no choice but to be directly involved providing our medicines uh, either free or below our cost, which we all do. And um, uh, it's little known, I think, in the public. Uh, I don't think any of us have patents on our products in Africa or most developing nations. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, uh, press about we should open it up to generics. I'll tell you what, any generic company on earth can make uh, our drugs today for those developing markets. They're, they have not shown a willingness thus far uh, to sell them below cost like we do. And, and so, uh, you know, consequently, again, um, I, I think all of us as companies have dealt with the burden of uh, a large portion of the volume we produce going to those areas. We've added capital and, and expanded our facilities to make more. Uh, some of our companies have outlicensed their uh, patents and technology to others, particularly in South Africa, to, uh, to make our drugs and provide them at uh, low cost or free. So I think the simple answer is, uh, yes, we have a responsibility. Uh, describe the benefits of Abbott's diversified portfolio of business and products, and why is it preferable to the pure play pharmaceutical or device businesses that were being broadly advocated just a few years ago. So this is probably a good time for me to, to give Cranes a plug. Uh, I didn't know about this article until I walked into my house this, tonight and my wife said, gee, you were on the front of Cranes today. And Gloria Scobie uh, kindly brought me a copy here tonight so I could see what Cranes had written. And, uh, and, and the article basically says Abbott's trying to be the next J&J. &J. We are the only two companies uh, in our industry that are a uh, broad, diverse mix of businesses, and that's by design. Uh, I think uh, that being a pure play pharmaceutical company, especially in a business as high risk 
as, uh, as the development of pharmaceuticals is, is a very risky thing for investors. And you can see that uh, in the ups and downs of some of the peer companies that, uh, that are in our peer group. Uh, we've always been a, a more diverse model. Uh, we believe that that helps us to balance our investments. It, it helps us balance a lot of different kinds of risks, uh, research risk, reimbursement risk, geographic risks, and so forth. Uh, we believe we can turn out um, more stable growth and earnings over time, and that also allows us to uh, invest at a more predictable and stable rate in all of our high-growth businesses. Uh, so we like that, that model much better uh, than one that uh, could, in a volatile way, uh, yank our company up and down in terms of our investments and spending. In, in a business like ours, where some of the research and development uh, cycle is as much as nine or ten years, uh, you've got to have a certain stability in there in order to sustain your investments in research. And I think being a much broader, diverse model of high growth and profitable businesses has served our investors and uh, the sustainability of our company pretty well. I think it's obviously sustained J&J &J pretty well, and the two of us uh, have tended to outperform the pure play companies, certainly over the last five years, and I take that as uh, evidence that we're right. Uh, once again, uh, thank you, Miles, very much for sharing your insights on a very uh, topic that's important to everybody in this room. So thanks again. And the uh, evening is adjourned. Safe travel home. <laughs>